Hello, Mount Sinai, and all those who are listening in. Uh, glad to see you. Glad you decided to come and join us uh, for another Bible study. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for all those who are gathered, who are listening. And Father, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure unto the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And last week, we began our third declaration of freedom. So if you're saying, what? I missed it? Then go to Mount Sinai, MBC of Memphis Incorporated, YouTube page. And there you will find all the messages that we have put out. And you can listen to last week's message. And better yet, you can listen to all of the messages put out by Mount Sinai. And you can hit that subscribe button and you will be notified each time we post a new message. So today, we're continuing on our third declaration of freedom. Freedom from discouragement, no frustration, which is found in Romans the 8th chapter, verses 18 through 30. But today, I'll only read verses 18 through 22. And this is the NIV. Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, but not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole world, the whole creation, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so here, Paul, in uh, the entirety of our verses, speaks of suffering and groaning. He speaks of creation groaning, he speaks of believers groaning, and finally he speaks of the Holy Spirit groaning. And our first focus is on the groaning of creation. When I'm studying, one of the things that I will do is ask questions of the scripture. And, and so with that in mind, my first question is, how does creation groan? According to Webster, to groan is to make a deep inarticulate sound in response to pain or despair. Groan is a verb, which is a word used to describe an action, state, or an occurrence. So how does creation groan? I'll read our verses again, but this time, listen for the answer to the question, how does creation groan? Verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself 
will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. So if you listen closely, you, you'll see that creation is subject, subjected to sufferings, frustration, bondage, decay, and pain. But Paul says, by no fault of his own. In other words, creation did nothing to cause its suffering. Verse 20 says, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Which brings me to my next question, which is a three-parter, three parts to this question. The three W's, what and who caused creation to groan and why? The, my quest uh, to, for the answer to these questions takes us back to the book of Genesis, back to the beginning. In the very first chapter of the Bible, we read how God created the earth in a six-day period. Light on the first day, the sky on the second day, land, sea, and all kinds of plants on the third day. The sun, the moon, the stars on the fourth day, birds for the sky, and animals for the water on the fifth day. All kinds of animals to fill the land on the sixth day. God spoke all things into existence and affirmed that it was good. He spoke it and then he said he, he saw that it was good. On the sixth day, in addition to speaking into existence the animals, God got personal and said, it said, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. God then called creation very good. And on the seventh day, God rested. So the second chapter in Genesis verses one through three says, thus the heavens and the earth was finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day, God rested. God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in, in it, he rested from all his work, which God created and made. So the first chapters of Genesis affirm that God alone is the creator of all that exists. It affirms that creation is very good in God's eye. And it also affirms that humanity is the high point of God's created world. And, and that God has made us special and has given us rule over the, over the creation. Note that when God made the entire universe, Everything was working as it should. The birds was flying, the animals were walking, and, 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 and everything was of, of age. The animals were walking of age, the trees were full and flourishing. Everything was as if it had been here for a while. Nothing had to come into maturity to, to come to itself. I like uh, watching HGTV a lot. And most times, it, when they are doing the landscape, 
they will plant mature trees and plant mature plants, not the saplings that will need to grow and mature before their full beauty can be seen. So when they finish a landscape, we see what it's going to look like. It's already flourishing. It's already mature. And in God's creation, everything was functioning as it should. Nothing had to come to itself. Nothing had to mature in order to work correctly. Everything was working as it should. Even Adam and Eve, God made man and woman. He didn't make two babies that had to grow up and mature. He didn't make a little girl or a little boy. He made woman, he made, he made man, and he made woman. They were fully functioning as a man and woman in the image of God. So creation uh, is happy. Mankind is happy. And they're both in harmony with God. Only life existed. Nothing died. There's nothing to disrupt the beauty that God had made. In this, uh, God made a garden, which was a beautiful garden. And God provided both abundance and he provided beauty. Adam and Eve had food to eat and they had God's magnificent handiwork to enjoy. Everything was beautiful. Everything was functioning. Everything was working as it should. They could enjoy the garden without worrying about allergies and, and what season it was. They didn't have to worry about being stung by wasps. They could eat without flies taking over. They could enjoy the stars at night without the mosquitoes eating them up. I could go on and on, but you get the point. They could enjoy some things that pretty much is unheard of for us. Sin had not entered the garden, so nothing was there to interrupt their happiness. They didn't even have to worry about what to wear. They didn't have a, a body image problem. The Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Then God, it says, God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eden means either delight or a place of much water. It suggests that this garden was a paradise from the hand of God. Then God took the man and placed him in the garden. God gave them uh, work to do. But the work was pleasant. Even the work wasn't hard. Genesis 2.15, the message version said, God took the man and set him down in the garden of Eden to work the ground and keep it in order. That tells me that God did not do it all in creation. Uh, he left some work for mankind. So, well, he did it all in creation, but he left some, some work. He built in some work for mankind. Maybe that's a better way of saying it, that he built in work for mankind. Even in paradise, man was not put there just to be idle. Again, the work was a joy. He wasn't pulling weeds and fighting with the soil. The work wasn't difficult. It wasn't laborious. Uh, then God gives the, the rules. He gives the terms by which his relationship with them could continue to exist in perfect harmony. God makes a covenant, which is a binding arrangement between two or more parties that govern their relationship. Genesis 2 and 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now note that God did not invite Adam to come to a meeting 
and together they would come up with some rules for the garden. God didn't say, come on, Adam, let's have this meeting. What do you think we ought to do? No, God commanded the man, which shows who is the creator and who is the created. And as creator, God has the right to tell man what he can and cannot do because everything belongs to God. Thus God made the terms of the agreement and obedience would keep them at home, obedience would keep them alive, and obedience would keep them in fellowship with God. God was really expressing his love. He let Adam know on the front end what would separate the two. All of God's commands are good commands and they bring good things to those who obey them. First John 5 and 3 says, and his commands are not burdensome. God didn't have a long list of do's and don'ts. There were no need, he didn't, he didn't need a tablet to write them down because he only gave one command. He placed two special trees in the middle of the garden the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Note how God gave the command. He started out by saying what they could do, that they were free to eat from any tree in the garden. And just think about that for a minute. The Bible says that the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden. Remember the word Eden means delight, a place of much water. It was a paradise created by God. God created the world to put his beauty on display. <coughs> Psalms 19 and 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. The beauty of God is seen in the glory of God. Of course, it's not the entirety of God, nothing is. But wherever God's glory is, his beauty is also there. There are some places on the earth that holds the title of paradise. They are magnificent places in splendor and grandeur but they are no comparison to the paradise, to a paradise from God. The Bible says that the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. God's beauty is being displayed. The trees were pleasing to the eye and good for food. God starts his command by saying, you are free to partake of any of this garden of beauty. Any tree in this garden of beauty, you are free to partake of it. But there is one, just one, restriction. One tree out of many that you may not eat from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Two trees planted by God in the midst of paradise, each with universal paths, one for life, the other a path that, a path that includes death. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Decisions, decisions. Which will they choose? Okay, we know, we already know. We already know which one they chose. But come back next week as we continue to look at why creation is moaning, groaning. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, help us to hear your voice. Help us to, to see Help us to hear. Help us to know what it is that you are telling us. Father, we thank you and we love you. 
in Jesus' name. Until next time, be blessed.